Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. It's good to see you in church this morning. It's hot outside. It's cool in here. I told this story in the 9.30 hour that uh, last night I started out on the wrong foot in my message by trying to be, you know, complaining about the heat. And instead what came to my mouth was, boy, I really wish I wasn't wearing pants right now. <laughs> and what I had meant to say or should have said, boy, it's hot. I should be wearing shorts right now. <laughs> And so I managed to get through the 9.30 service for not saying anything stupid. I'm really hoping I do that today, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I guess that's your judgment call if I say anything stupid, right? You'll let me know afterwards or send an email to Pastor Tim. Um, uh, well, again, I want to just, uh, if, you, if you missed the announcements, weren't here at the beginning, we announced that August 9th is big Sunday here. Uh, it's Baptism Sunday where we're going to have youth and kids and adults immediately after this service right outside the courtyard. We'll have a, a portal of baptism set up and we're just going to have a big party and we're going to celebrate people committing their lives to following Jesus through baptism and it's going to be a great day. And so I, for one, believe that sometimes churches get funerals and baptisms mixed up like it's got to be all serious and everything and there should be no greater party in the life and existence of a church than when people people are being baptized. And I don't know about you, but it's why I choose to do what I do, is to see people commit to following Jesus. And uh, so that's going to be a great time. And then on August 9th as well, that same, that same day, we'll be kicking off a new series called The Collection, Songs, Prayers, and Praises from the Psalms, where for about four or five weeks, a different pastor will come and share from their favorite psalm and draw the life application out of it. And so it'll be a good way to get people excited about reading the Psalms if you're not already reading the Psalms or maybe you haven't in a long time. And so, But today we continue on with our Peeled series, Peeled, looking at the fruit of the Spirit and I get the topic of gentleness this morning. It's not a topic that I've got, I have a lot of experience teaching on. It's just kind of been one of those things where I had to look back in my mind just, when was the last time I spoke on gentleness? And I, I don't know. It's not something that you speak about very much, gentleness. But let's start with Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. When I put together a message, I do it differently than probably Pastor Tim. I do it, every one of us do things a little differently. But what works for me, when I, when I have the time allotted, sometimes you find out you're, you're preaching the day before or whatever, and you, you can't do everything the way you normally would want to. But normally when I've got the time, I start by creating my own little storyboard. And if you're not familiar with a storyboard, um, every filmmaker goes through the process of storyboarding before making a film. The writers, directors, producers, the creators, they'll come together. In fact, you can watch documentaries online about Pixar films and how they storyboard. It's really, really fascinating. But it's where they basically throw any idea, words, ideas, stories, whatever, images, up into a wall, and they begin to create their story out of this storyboard. And that's how I do things. It's usually on a notepad where I'll, begin, I'll sit down for about hour to two hours in total silence around nobody but myself and I just begin to write down everything that comes to my mind. A scripture verse, a story, a song, a, a, a movie scene, a memory from my family and I'll just begin to write things down and Eventually, I, I can say, okay, this is a really bad idea. That would be a total fail. This is going to be really good. I'll use this. And, and that's how I come up with my outline, okay? And so I started last week by storyboarding this message by just writing gentleness. What comes to my mind first when I think of the word gentleness? And a lot of the things that were coming out on the paper looked like this. Um, 
how many times I've had to tell my boys to be gentle with their baby sister. Be gentle with your baby sister, right? When she was a little baby. and Well, now she's three and a half going on four, and she's probably the toughest one in the whole family. We're actually telling her at times, Brooklyn, don't hit so hard. Be gentle with your 11-year-old brother, okay? Or how many times we've told the kids when they're really little and they're crawling, they're toddlers, and we've said, be gentle with the dog. Be gent don't pull his ears, don't pull his hair or his tail. And our dog is named Sparky. And uh, maybe I'll bring him to church sometime. Is that allowed? Can we bring You bring your dog. Is your dog with you right now in the car? Or, I hope not. It better not be. <laughs> better not be, but uh, Sparky is a great dog. He is a total gentle dog. He's a big muscular. He's part Rottweiler and part Springer Spaniel. And so his coat, he looks like a, he's got black and white spots. He looks like a Springer Spaniel, but he's got the size and muscle of, of a Rottweiler. And he's so gentle with the kids, except don't pull his tail. That's where you get the wrath of Sparky. And uh, um, but I was thinking also about the times when me and my sister, when we were kids, my parents would take us after school during Christmas time to Seattle, downtown to Seattle, to look at all the Christmas lights and see Santa. And we'd have, remember the old Frederick and Nelson store? We'd have di dinner there and everything. And I always remember this image. It's so funny how little things can just pop into your head. But I remember we would always park in this parking garage that was connected to what is now Macy's, back then to Bon Marche. And we'd walk across this walking bridge, and it would put you right out into what I always called the fancy floor. Okay, the fancy floor was where they basically sold all the china and the, the vases or vases, however you like to call it, the foyer, the foyer, whatever. Okay, and Pastor Ben and I got into a discussion this week about whether it's a foyer or foyer. So I'm foyer, and he's foyer, which makes me right and him wrong. But. Uh, <laughs> And we'd walk in there, and my mom would always say, put my hands in my pockets, because she was always afraid that I was going to knock a display over or, you know, tip something over, break something, right? Always put your hands in your pockets. And I do that sometimes, too, with my kids. Like, be gentle with this stuff, okay? I can't afford to replace that, right? And uh, I started thinking, everything that was coming out was just, like, soft and cozy and warm. Like, you know, you're petting a cuddly kitten, and it was just like, everything was just kind of weak and blah. It's like, is this really gentleness? Well, and then I start digging into the scriptures a little bit, and I discover, which it shocked me, really. I was surprised. Gentleness is throughout scripture. Proverbs is full of it. Um, in First Peter, he talks about being gentle. Paul commands Timothy to be gentle to those who are his critics. And, and then here in Galatians chapter 5, gentleness is everywhere. But only twice in the scripture are people called gentle. There's only two people in all of the Bible who are called gentle. Can anyone guess who they might be? And if you were in a previous service, you can't guess. And no, I don't have any prizes for you, but can anyone guess who is called gentle in the scriptures? No, not John. Mary. Jesus is one who said Jesus. Michelle, okay, Jesus. Jesus is one. Not Mary. Pastor Tim guessed Goliath in the last service. <laughs> Moses. Moses, of all people. Jesus describes himself as gentle in Matthew chapter 11, but if you go to Numbers chapter 12, it says that it describes Moses as, at that time, being the most gentle man in all the face of the earth. Moses. Are Moses and Jesus, when you think of them, do you think of them as weak people? Absolutely not. Two of the most important people in all of Scripture, in the whole grand narrative of God's Word, Moses and Jesus are central to that grand theme, right? But they are not weak. They are strong. But yet both are called gentle. And I just want to share that living a life marked by gentleness in today's culture, just like it took courage for Moses and Jesus to live with gentleness, it takes courage for us today to live with gentleness. And we truly do display a godly strength, a godly strength, when we live with a gentle manner. Things like aggression 
and anger and tantrums. And I don't mean the three-year-old tantrum type like my daughter can pull off. I mean full-grown adult tantrums, okay? Rudeness, be, rude behavior, all these things, short tempers, all, we see these behaviors every day. They've become pretty common in our society, in our culture today. Why is that? Well, I believe it's become so common because it's easy. It's easy to act that way because, frankly, aggression and rudeness and, and tantrums, they all show a lack of discipline. Anything that requires discipline is hard. It takes courage. It takes strength. If gentleness were easy, Paul would not have to teach about it so much. He wouldn't be writing about it so much. He wouldn't be saying that you can't, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to produce it in you. What he's saying is that you're in a direct partnership with God when it comes to gentleness or kindness or patience or love or faithfulness. It's not easy. It requires discipline. But Jesus... When we look at the Gospels, Jesus constantly sets the example for strong gentleness, living with courage while being gentle, living under the power of God while being gentle. And in Mark chapter 3, we find one of my favorite stories in all the Gospel. If you, if you stick around long enough, you'll hear me preach from this story several times in sometimes different contexts and things like that. But... I just wanted to pick this story because I think that he puts on display both the power of God and the gentleness of God. And it says, I'm going to read from the message today, which is a, a, a paraphrase of the Bible, if you will, and, and it just it gave a, a good creative way of kind of sharing the story. Verse 1. Then he went back to the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. Now, sometimes, I'll be honest with you, when I read the Bible, especially the gospel stories, I create drama in my mind, okay? I get creative. I want to put myself in this setting. This is one of those times where when I read, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction, in my head, I'm thinking, da-da-da-da, right? Drama. Hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. He said to the man with the crippled hand, so Jesus clearly understands that these people are thinking, oh, let's see and watch. Let's watch and wait and see if he breaks the law and heals on the Sabbath. And he does something very courageous. He draws the crippled man from this hiding. No crippled man in this time, in this culture, would want to be front and center in the synagogue. They're already feeling like an outcast because of their crippled nature, helpless. Jesus brings him front and center. Stand here where we can see you. Then he spoke to the, to the people. What kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. No one said a word. He looked at them in the eye, one after another, angry now, furious at their hard-nosed religion. And he said to the man, hold out your hand. He held it out, and it was as good as new. The Pharisees got out as fast as they could, sputtering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. Your translation probably says, kill him. These guys were so convinced that religion was the way, that they completely missed what was happening right in front of the very eyes, both the power and gentleness of God being put on display and restoring not just a man's hand, but his whole life. And they completely missed it, because that's what indifference does. It strips us of the things of the Spirit. It tells us, I no longer care. When it comes to healing, Pastor Tim clearly has been burdened with the news of his neighbor, his good friend, and his, his, the life or death situation that he's in. You may be sitting here today and you've been praying, you've been burdened with uh, the physical problems of yourself or a neighbor, a family member, a friend, and you've been asking God, begging God for healing. 
Think of this story. Think of this story here. We always pray that God, you would move in power, move mightily in power. And sometimes we don't realize that when God moves in power, He's also showing us this amazing display of gentleness and care. Think of a doctor. I've been fortunate enough to only break a few bones in my body, never anything really bad like a compound fracture or anything like that. But I do have friends who motorcycle accidents or whatnot have broken their legs. TJ, I hope you're listening to that. <clears throat> he's not, he's on his phone, he's not listening. He, he rides a motorcycle, anyways. Um, when that happens, so I have a good friend down to Tacoma who broke his femur a few years ago on a, on a motocross, motocross accident. What, when the doctor, before they can do anything, they have to reset the bone. Now a good doctor knows exactly where to gently lay their hands, puts their hands in the right place, but with force puts those bones together, sets those bones. It's both gentleness and force going on at the same time. And healing can't happen in that bone until those two things take place. Whenever God moves in power in our lives, in this church, in this community, he's also acting with great gentleness because it's his very nature to be a good father. We had TJ sing that song, introduce that new song to you. It's a, it's a relatively new song. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. I am loved. It's who I am. It's who I am. Friends, to understand gentleness, to understand how we are to be gentle, we have to first receive the truth that God himself is gentle, and he's not some aloof, angry, carefree, disappointed being looking down at creation and become indifferent because of the ways that we've, we've gone. And I say that because I'm convinced that there are so many people sitting in churches today who still believe that God is angry at them. For whatever reason, they still believe that God is angry towards them. I have had conversations recently with people who believe that God just no longer cares. Because they say, I see all this injustice going on in the world, and I just wonder, where is God in all of this? Is he just indifferent now? No. Does God get angry? Read the scriptures. Yes, God does get angry, but anger is not God's nature. Love is his nature. Gentleness is his nature. Me as a father, do I get angry sometimes at my children? Not once have I ever been angry at my child, children. Have I ever been angry at Crystal? Not once. That's a fight I don't want to enter, okay? No, of course, I've been angry towards my children. But if you ask any of them, is it your dad's nature to be angry at them? No, they know I love them. They know I love them. I love the prophet Micah. It's just kind of this obscure, very short book in the Old Testament. In fact, Micah, Amos, Joel, three of my favorite books in all the Old Testament. It speaks to so much, I think, that is relevant today to where the church as a whole is and needs to hear. But that's another sermon, another time. But he says, Micah chapter 7, You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Think about times when you've had maybe a moment with someone very close to you, a spouse, a child, a mom, dad, whatever, and you just felt this immense presence of delight for whatever reason. You were delighting in that person. That is how God feels about each and every one of us at all times. He delights to show his unfailing love. Now the secret to living a life of gentleness, I can't say I've nailed that down because I've got a lot of work to do in this area. But I want to tell you a story of two words that were spoken to me years ago by my pastor who I was working for at the time and two words that have shaped 
a lot of who I am as a father, husband, a pastor, and who I try to be. It was way, way, way back, 1999. I was um, a much younger, a little bit thinner youth pastor working with middle school students. And I was for several years, seven or eight years, I was a middle school pastor. And so uh, when I see like yesterday in the office, I came in the office about 2.30 to do some work and I saw Pastor Josh, our new middle school pastor, and he's working, he's processing all the forms and registrations and stuff for camp. And it brought back a lot of good memories because I remember doing that for middle school camps and, and things like that. And we were sharing stories and People, have asked, people used to ask me, why do you want to work with middle school kids? Because it's, they're so squirrely. They're, I mean, I, they say, you know, it's like hurting cats. It really, it really is. It's just like, you know, stop, stop, stop what you're doing, right? Just, they're so squirrely. But here's why I used to always want to work with middle school kids. Because I could look in the eyes of a 12-year-old or 13-year-old student and say, John, I love you, buddy. I'm proud of you. And there's something about that age where they look at you, whether they have a, a great close relationship with their dad or not, and they just look at you and they believe you. They receive it. But something happens between that age and about 17 or 18. Kids get a little more jaded. They, they, come to, they start to question things more. It's just natural. I was the same way. You say the same thing to a, a senior in high school, and a lot of times it's kind of like, oh yeah, prove it, all right? So I just loved working with middle school kids. And it's fun to see now. I've, I've married some of them, performed their marriage ceremony, as to say. <laughs> that would just be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> you missed that in the background check, huh? Um, anyways. I lost my train of thought here. 1999. We were doing a... Every week we did a, an inner city outreach. We were an inner city church. My youth group was made up of mostly inner city kids from all spectrums of, from poverty to, to wealth to homeless kids to great families. And every Friday night we did an outreach called Impact where we coned off a lot of the parking lot. We set up half pipe, skate ramps, um, in the gym, loud music, three on three basketball tournaments and pizza and all this kinds of stuff. And, and at the end of the night for like the last 45 minutes we had a service where we'd present the gospel and we'd have music and things like that and a fun service and it was all about presenting the gospel in the most basic form to these kids and we did this every Friday night and it was growing hundreds of kids were beginning to come and it was funny because one of the best things that happened to us was the Tacoma News Tribune heard about it and did a big front page feature. It was also the worst thing that happened to us because the next Friday we were not prepared for how many kids were going to show up because of the attention that got through the newspaper. So we had to start implementing some procedures and things like we had to hire two Tacoma police officers every Friday night to be present there. We had to buy new more bike racks because bikes were getting stolen so we had posters up everywhere that said during the service bikes must be locked up and all these things. Well, there was one kid who had been coming for a while, and this one particular night, he decided he, wasn't want, he didn't want to lock up his bike. And so after the service, it's about 10 o'clock, everyone comes rushing out, parents are there to pick him up, most of the kids just walked home or rode their bikes home, and his bike was gone. It's gone, stolen. And for whatever reason, I do remember not having a lot of sympathy for him that night. Maybe it was just a long day, a long week, but I just... Truthfully, I just didn't care at the time. I was like, hey, buddy, I'm sorry. We've got signs everywhere. You've been coming here. You know you're supposed to lock your bike up. Nothing I can do. I went about my business. We cleaned up. Weekend, Tuesday afternoon, I'm walking through the parking lot, relatively empty parking lot, out to my car, and I can hear a car speeding up quickly behind me and I turn around and there's a car veering right towards me literally to the point where I have to jump out of the way and I stand up quickly to find out what's going on I'm ready to fight okay I'm just gonna be honest with you I'm ready to fight and it's a lady and she starts screaming obscenities at me and yelling at me and threatening that I'm going to find out where you live and all these things. We're going to sue your church for everything you got. I have no clue what's going on, why this is happening. It was the boy's mom. The boy who's had his bike stolen. It was his mom. 
I was, of course, this rattled me, right? I'm furious, I'm ticked, I'm ready for a plan of attack. I go right back in the church office to tell my pastor exactly what happened so that these people can pay a price for their actions, right? So I go, I know knock on his door. He was always great at just being, no matter how busy he was, you know, yes, come in and sat down with me. He's about 70 years old, been a pastor a long time, full of wisdom, and, and I'm 27, young, don't really, still don't really know what I'm doing, and uh, still feel that way at 43 sometimes, but, you know, that's another story. And I begin to tell him what happens, and I'm just like, yes, we're going to show these people. We've got great lawyers, and, you know, go ahead and try and sue us, and all these things, and we're going to come up with a plan of attack. And after telling them everything that happened and everything she just did to me, he sits back in his chair. He's got those high back leather chairs. He sits back in his chair, and he says, Rex, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. So I'm ready. I'm waiting. And he says, you're going to stay sweet. And then he says, and you're going to buy him a new bike. What? I, I literally, in my head, it almost came out of my mouth. I'm glad I didn't. But literally in my head, I was thinking, that's the dumbest advice I've ever heard in my life. What does stay sweet even mean? Stay sweet? And he says, yeah. And he began to say, and this is where his wisdom kicks in. He says, do you really think that she would have gone through all that work, all those threats, all that anger, spewing all that venom on you just because one bike was stolen? Or do you think that there's possibly a lot bigger stuff happening in this family's life? And I was like, okay, I get, I get it, I get it, all right, you're right. And he says, you need to stay sweet. This family doesn't need another pastor to be a jerk. That's too easy. What they need is our love, our care, and gentleness. So stay sweet and go buy him a new bike. So he didn't make me buy it out of my pocket, but you know, the church, we bought him a new bike. And I have no idea where this family is at. I have no idea where this kid is at or whatever happened. The point is, that was some of the greatest advice ever given to me in my life. Because in our daily living, we're constantly bombarded with opportunities to not be gentle, right? He says, just stay sweet. After, after the 5.30 service, an elderly woman comes up to me and says to me the funniest thing. It made me laugh out loud. I've been thinking about it ever, th ever since. She said, you know, Pastor, what I've always said, sweet breaks the heat. <laughs> sweet, or sweet melts the heat. Sweet melts the heat. That was her way of saying stay sweet. I loved it. But Solomon had another way of saying it in Proverbs chapter 15. He says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Harsh words make tempers flare. I love the word deflects. If you're a Star Wars fan, you know, Star Trek, you just think force field, okay? It's a force field. It deflects anger. But that's hard to do, right? Frankly, it's just easier to raise your voice towards your spouse or towards your boss or your coworker when they're yelling at you. It just is. It's easier just to try and beat them in the argument by yelling. The harder thing to do is to reply with gentleness. Every time Jesus is confronted with people, every single time throughout the Gospels, he comes back at them with gentleness. But it's not a pushover gentleness. It's not a cozy, I'm going to cuddle and pet my kitty cat kind of gentleness. It's not, I'm going to have my hands in my pocket so I don't break anything kind of gentleness. No, he shows great strength in his gentleness. We are at our strongest when we are gentle. I show strength to my family when I am gentle towards them. I show strength as a pastor when I lead with gentleness. And how many times I've had to say these words to myself, stay sweet, Rex, stay sweet. Two of the greatest words ever spoken to me, ever. 
following Jesus means saying yes over and over every single day. Yes, 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 Jesus, to a lifestyle of gentleness in our words, in our actions, and in our thoughts. Yes, Jesus, because his kingdom says that gentleness is the way of the Father. And if you're going to call yourself a follower of Jesus, gentleness will be a marking in your life. We are strong as a church. Washington Cathedral is strong, not because of the size of its auditorium or the size of its budget or how many people are coming to all of its programs. That is not our strength. The culture will look at that and say, that is a strong church. Our strength, friends, is found in our gentleness and how we live Monday through Saturday in this community. How we live in our homes. Our strength is found when we are gentle in our culture. Is it common? Is it popular? Absolutely not. But here's what I believe is absolute truth. Our culture craves it. Our culture craves gentleness. It's become so easy to live with aggression and anger and short-temperedness and rudeness. People need to see gentleness put on display. And so in, this week in your office, in your home, around the dinner table, whatever it might be, when someone is coming down on you, someone is showing aggression to you, think of those words, stay sweet. A gentle answer deflects anger. And when, I, when, when we talk about being a light into our community, one of the most just practical ways of being that light is just by being a gentle person. And trust me, friends, I had someone come to me earlier and say, I really see a gentle spirit in you. Friends, it's not always been like that. Let me tell you. It hasn't. It's taken years of asking God to produce that in me. A lot of discipline. And I believe that if you're sitting here today and you know deep in your heart that you're, you're just not gentle right now. Your kids know it. Maybe your spouse knows it. People close to you know it. It's not too late. If Jesus can say, take out your hand and create a brand new hand, he can heal us of this and create within us a gentle spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all the services that took place this weekend. Thank you for every single person, man, woman, student, who volunteered this weekend in some way, as greeters, as setup team, teardown team, musicians, teachers, whomever they are. God, may they just be rewarded in some way, blessed in some way, God, because of their faithful service. Thank you for every... Um, service this week, and I pray, God, that this message would just be a simple seed, a simple seed planted in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you just take it from here. Holy Spirit, you help it to grow. Produce gentleness in us, God. May we be a strong church, a strong people because of our gentleness. In your name I pray. Amen.